The title of the book is Life is Elsewhere, Symbolic Geography in Russian Literature, 1800 to 1917. And in case everybody's wondering, Life is Elsewhere um, is a line, it's an adapted line from the poet Rimbaud, La vraie vie est, est absente, the real life is absent. Um, and I'm going to start with the words of a not Russian writer, the Mexican poet Octavio Paz. In his 1990 essay, In Search of the Present, Paz describes the experience of growing up in Mexico in the 20th century. But his words evoke the same sense of dis displacement and metaphysical and absence that we've often heard Russian writers evoke. Paz says, for us, the real present was not in our own countries. It was the time lived by others, by the English, the French, the Germans. It was the time of New York, Paris, London. We had to go and look for it and bring it back home. So I wanted to start with this observation because what Life is Elsewhere is about is not just the symbolic geography of 19th century Russian literature, but more fundamentally, what it means to live with the belief that one's own life and place are somehow not real. The result is constant deferral, constant searching. In the words of the American poet Claudia Rankin, transcendence is unevenly distributed and experienced. So Rankin's work analyzes how people of color in America have to work for what's freely given to white people. And that has nothing to do with Russia. But it has everything to do with life on precarious cultural margins, which is where many Russian writers felt or feared themselves to be. And for some of these Russian writers, as for Octavio Paz and Claudia Rankin, an often painful sense of dislocation and out of syncness ends up being astonishingly productive, which should remind us that being peripheral or provincial is not the same as being limited or unsophisticated. The creativity that takes shape on cultural margins was what the critic Andrei uh, Sinyavsky was referring to when he wrote, quote, art has the provinces in its blood. Art is provincial in principle, preserving for itself a naive, external, astonished, and envious look. So the book is about why and how a certain image of provincia, the provinces, took shape in Russian literature. And I say an image of provincia because the book is not about the realities of provincial life or provincial history. Rather, it's about uh, a certain trope in mainstream Russian literary culture. It explores the symbolic weight that provincial places were made to bear in high culture, focusing above all on the gaze that the center has directed toward the non-exotic near periphery that the center defines as the provinces. And this is the standard caveat that I learned to issue whenever I talk to my work about historians of things local and regional, because in a sense, I'm studying the problem that confronts them, the problem that confronts anyone who's working to focus attention on the reality of Russia's regional variations and identities, only to confront instead a series of often counterfactual tropes. For example, all provincial towns are the same. There's no history in the provinces, et cetera, et cetera. So um, as a way of thinking about these tropes and how they've shaped literature, I think it helps to look at two maps from two different traditions. And they represent radically different ways of thinking about geographic space. And now there's the challenge of share screen. Let's see what happens. Okay, that is share screen, but it's supposed to be this. There, okay. Um, does everybody see the maps? Yes? Yes. Okay. So we're actually going to start with the image um, on the right. This is a Moscow postal map from around 1808, and I'm grateful to John Randolph at the University of Illinois for sharing it with me long ago. See that Moscow stands at the center of a web-like system. It's the hub of a wheel and their spokes extending out to the perimeter. And the perimeter forms a ring with stations or towns every 20 to 30 versts. Um, the spokes that stretch out in all directions toward the empire's borders. This is characteristic of the coach relay system that connected the pre-modern empire. Um, and if you look at a road map of Russia today, you can still see kind of a shadow or more than a shadow of this same arrangement, many roads leading back to Moscow. 
Petersburg, by contrast, is supported mostly by one road, which is the one that Radishchev made famous. So what do we learn from an image like this? Well, we see how the human geography of settlement around Moscow came to be organized according to a communicative logic of pre-modern empire, which did not think in terms of grids. More importantly, I think, for our purposes, um, it has implications for how Russians imagined geographic space. Because even after technologies of transportation changed, Russian space often continued to be imagined as a series of concentric circles centered on Moscow. So this is a symbolic geography with a middle. Um, and in 19th century discussions of European Russia, words like middle, center, heart, nucleus, seed, core, and inner recur over and over. As the 19th century ethnographer Maximov put it, Moscow's centrality was absolute. Quote, it's no accident that Moscow lies at the very center of Rus, he writes, corresponding to Russia's middle with what he calls mathematical precision. Or in the words of the memoirist F.N. Glinka, Moscow is Russia's, quote, central sun around which other towns appear like planets. Now, of course, we know that the boundaries of what was considered central Russia were redrawn many times, just as the boundaries of Europe and European Russia were redrawn. But the idea that Russia had a middle, a space that was both interior and central, was rarely challenged, nor was the assumption that this space was uniquely important. Um, as Mayakovsky put it, начинается земля, как известно, от Кремля. The world, the earth begins, as is well known, at the Kremlin. Okay, so now let's look at the second map. Um, this is what's usually known as Thomas Jefferson's Land Ordinance of 1785. And this image represents the physical space of North America, as well as a plan for colonizing, organizing, governing, and imagining this space. The space was seen as more or less empty in the sense that it was both uncultivated and it didn't have white people in it. So obviously the first thing we noticed if we compare it to the Russian map, there is no center. And this implies, um, as I'll explain, that no particular place is necessarily more important than any other place. So instead of rings, Jefferson's map lays down a mechanical grid over the surface of the continent. And in my analysis of the grid, I'm drawing on a scholar of American literature named Philip Fisher. Fisher explains how Jefferson's map imagines the continent as a series of interlocking and essentially interchangeable Lego-like squares, um, each of which could be subdivided to yield farms of a certain number of acres or could be extended out ultimately to define state borders. And those are the borders that you see sometimes when you fly over the Midwestern United States, these borders that are so straight um, that they look that they could have been drawn with a ruler. And the map can be read as an expression of what Fisher calls a Cartesian social space, identical point to point, and potentially unlimited in extent. So in this kind of space, the space that's imagined by the grid, all parts are in theory, identical, and therefore, in theory, any part can stand for or represent the whole. And that means that in theory, Kansas City, Missouri, or Fresno, California, or Denver, Colorado, or whatever, has the same claim to meaning and representativeness as does New York City or Washington, D.C., or any place else. According to this utopian vision, America's democratic social space was supposed to be, again, in Fisher's words, a universal and everywhere similar medium in which rights and opportunities were identical. Um, so obviously you can't get much further from America's relentlessly equalizing grid than Russia's series of concentric circles radiating out from a single focal point. So what does this difference tell us about how meaning inheres or does not inhere in geographic space? Um, I, in the Russian map, I would argue that what happens in semiotic terms as you move away from the center of the circle is that meaning is diluted, coherence fades, and entropy prevails. So this helps explain why a Russian historian would write in 1901, quote, 
In order to understand any of Russia's peripheral regions, one has to start by understanding the seed that gave rise to Russian strength and vitality that then spread outward to the borderlands. So the center of Russia was seen as the vital source of all energy and innovation, the seed, the kernel, but it was also seen as being sometimes vulnerable to the diffusing, squandering, and tropic effects of all that surrounding empty space. Okay, now I'm gonna stop the screen share. And I hope keeping the maps in mind, um, I wanna think about a passage in, in a Chekhov story, a well-known story, um, very short and very strange, but strange in a way that we might not necessarily notice um, because we're so used to this certain version of strangeness. Um, this is an 1899 story called Unofficial Business, Padilam Slujbe. And here there's a young government official. He's originally from Moscow, but he's been assigned to serve in a kind of remote district, some unspecified Russian province. And he's sent out to investigate the unexplained suicide of another official. So he's being sent further and further out. Um, and he finds himself in a miserable village, which is given a name, Sirnya, but no discernible location. And here he's forced to spend hours in a dark, dark hut alone with the suicide's corpse. And there's a blizzard raging, raging outside. So it seems scary, right? But he's not afraid. And the reason he's not afraid is that he thinks nothing here is meaningful enough to be frightening. So Lesion, the bureaucrat, muses, quote, if this person had killed himself in Moscow or someplace near Moscow, then it would have been interesting, important, even frightening. But here, a thousand verses from Moscow, all this is somehow seen in a different light. It's not life, not people. It would not leave the least trace in the memory and would not frighten and would be forgotten as soon as he departed, unquote. He thinks everything in this remote place is, quote, alien, trivial, and uninteresting, unquote. So, in this character's estimation, what's wrong with, this, with the provinces is that things here don't mean anything. Quote, he thinks to himself, Legion thinks, everything here is accidental, so China, there can be no conclusion drawn from it, unquote. Over and over, he returns to the thought that, quote, here there's no life, just bits of life, fragments, everything here is accidental, unquote. So he longs for what he calls the cultural center, a place, quote, where nothing is accidental, where everything is in accordance with reason and law, where every suicide is comprehensible, and one can explain why it is and what significance it has in the general scheme of things. So, to, excuse me, to reiterate, what strikes Chekhov's Moscow official as most painful about the hideous event he's investigating is precisely its distance from the center. It's this distance that somehow renders all phenomena unbearably trivial. So what he finds intolerable is not the awful suicide, the intractable poverty, the dirty hut, the snowstorm, or the injustice. It is instead the fact that this backwater has no ability to confer significance on any of it. The way he sees it, the, meaning, the meaninglessness of anything that might happen in this place is a consequence of the place itself. Um, so according to the schema of, implied in Shekhov's text, only phenomena that fall within range of the capital's ordering powers will be rendered legible and significant. Everything else will slip into chaos or insignificance. And I would argue that this very short story both reproduces and critiques the powerful and powerfully distorting images that have shaped how Russian literature represents the nation's space. The semiotic system reflected here assumes that what happens in the center, in the Staritsa, the capitals, is meaningful. What happens outside in Provincia is meaningless. meaningless. Um, now, what's really strange is that in literature, the system that Chekhov's story imagines and that we saw in the map earlier, this system holds true not just for Moscow, but also for Petersburg. And Petersburg, of course, is not situated in the geographic center of the nation, far from it. As Lutman wrote, quote, Petersburg is the kind of capital that's located at the very edge of the nation's cultural space, unquote. And yet, ever since its founding, Petersburg has proven capable of functioning as a center 
that is in relationship to Prevencia, to the periphery. And this is why, to return to the story, Chekhov's lesion can actually make a strange, the strange world of conflating Moscow and Petersburg. He thinks to himself in another supremely weird passage, quote, our homeland, the real Russia, is Moscow and Petersburg, but here's just the provinces, the colonies. Rodina Nastayasha Rasia at Moskva Peterburg as Ches Provincia Polonia. So Moscow and Petersburg. As this suggests, in many works of literature, the two capitals play almost identical roles in spite of the very obvious differences in, which e in, in what each city stands for. So, for example, if you think about three sisters, Chekhov's Prozorovs, they're standing on their provincial porch and they're saying, to Moscow, to Moscow. But what they're doing is virtually identical to what Vogel's provincials are doing in the Inspector General when they direct their gaze longingly toward Petersburg. That is, all these provincials are dreaming of the capital's signifying power. For Chekhov's characters and for Gogol's characters, the capital, it could be any capital, is a quasi-magical and basically unreal ideal toward which all the provincials are looking in a kind of desperate hope that their insignificant lives will take on meaning once it, they're subjected to the center's ordering logos. So that's why you have in the Inspector General, a character, I can't remember if it's Bobchinsky or Dobchinsky says um, uh, to Chestakov, please, please go to the Petersburg, go to Petersburg and tell them that I exist, right? That's how he knows that, that's how he will know that he exists. Um, so what this makes clear is that the doubling of real life capitals, having two capitals, did not disrupt this powerful center periphery binary. In fact, having two competing centers seems even to have rendered the opposition between capital and province more powerful. Similarly, I think that the existence of non-Russian and semi-Russian places within the empire, places like Siberia, Ukraine, the Caucasus, even the steppes, even this didn't really disrupt the dualistic province capital opposition that we see in literary representation. I think that in the Russian cultural imaginary overall, the empire's various borderlands and frontiers were most often seen as being opposed to Russia, real Russia, with the result that the presence of all these less than fully Russian spaces within the territorially unified empire, maybe even intensified, the tendency to collapse the heterogeneous regions of European or Central Russia into this idea of the provinces. So to reiterate the existence of exotic but contiguous and accessible outer regions didn't prevent people from seeing Russia proper as being divided between the capitals and the provinces, with the capitals conceived of as simply, I'm sorry, with the provinces conceived of simply as the not capital. Thus, the provinces come to be imagined as a mass of grimly uniform, uniform places in opposition to which the capitals took on their meaning. Um, so as Chekhov's story suggests, part of what both Moscow and Peter, Petersburg have served to do is diminish the significance of everything that lies outside them, rendering these places, these heterogeneous places, mere provinces. Another way to say it would be that the overdetermined insignificance of Provincia is what allows the capital, whichever capital, to take on such significance. So um, you might say that uh, like, quote, black people in America whose blackness has served to render others white, the meaninglessness of Provincia might actually make possible the meaningfulness of the capitals. Um, the actual physical location of the center, whether it's Moscow or Petersburg, doesn't really matter once you find yourself in a non-exotic, non-borderland Russian space outside the capital. What's important is the opposition itself. So Petersburg is able to function as a center from its very inception. Um, to, to take it a little bit further, um, you could also uh, you could also imagine that the Russian center is, in a sense, portable. So as Mikhail, Mikhail Epstein has written, quote, 
in Russian history, even the capital itself could be transformed into a province in as much as the sovereign would transfer his seat to a specially created or minimally populated center. So this is what happens, for example, with the founding of Petersburg. And then Epstein says the center would lose its geographic incarnation. These geographic transfers of state power served to, quote, provincialize the entire world that had been abandoned, torn away from the capital throne, unquote. But again, the fact that the center is portable and maybe therefore in some sense illusory does not make it any less important. The Staritsa, the capital, wherever it is or is not, always stands as an elusive, unreachable ideal standard against other places will be judged and found wanting. So I hope this helps explain why one of the most important tropes in Russian literature is the wretched and anonymous provincial town, usually labeled just Borod N, probably best translated into English as Town X. And I remember when I first started reading Russian literature, I was very confused by this. This is not, this is not a formulation that recurs in American literature. Um, and I couldn't understand why there were all these towns that were left unnamed. Um, from Gogol to Dabuichin and beyond, we encountered these imaginary places, and they're usually represented as being at once repulsively alien and intimately familiar. Um, and this, this gets reproduced over and over again, even um, when authors try to resist this binary and its homogenizing effects on provincial space, um, they are often nonetheless obliged to engage with the binary in some way just because it's so powerful and so powerfully distorting. Um, and we're so used to the image that we might fail to recognize how puzzling it really should be. So to try to get a little bit more specific, where exactly are these provincial places? So when we're talking about provincia, where exactly are we talking about besides the not capital? Well, first of all, the label provincial does not refer to rural life, and only sometimes does it refer to the life of the gentry estate. So rural life is the village, that would be Dirievne, Dirievensky, whereas Provincialny or Gubiertsky, which are essentially equivalent for much of the 19th century, those words generally refer to cities or towns, and sometimes to gentry estates that are failing to attain to a certain level of civilization. So peasants are never provincials. Peasant culture is not provincial culture. Peasants are not trying and, and failing to follow the mode of the capital. They're not implicated in the system that Franco Moretti so wonderfully describes as, quote, fashion, this great metropolitan idea, this engine that never stops and makes the provinces feel old and ugly and jealous and, for, and seduces them forever and a day. So what marks provincials, but definitely not peasants, is a fatal lack of ease and naturalness. And this is what we see over and over as the defining characteristic of provincial places and provincial people. They are not, quote, being themselves. Peasants, though, are not speaking bad French. They're not boasting of their decidedly local high society. Peasants are associated with the folk authenticity. And it's precisely authenticity to which the provincial sphere, sphere has no claim. So. so to be provincial is to be behind. You can only be behind if you inhabit a social world that believes in progress, fashion, the march of enlightenment, etc. Thus, provinciality is a decidedly modern phenomenon bound up not only with modern forms of government, like centralized control, but also with modern forms of consum consumption, like ever-changing fashions, and with economic exchange, entertainment, artistic trends, etc. Provincials are above all imitators, trying to catch up. So I think the story of Russia's sense of its own provincial status is the story of its desire to be modern and Western two terms that have, of course, too often been taken to mean the, mean the same thing. Okay, so what about the gentry estate? Um, a gentry estate, regardless of its location, could be either deep, deeply provincial in the sense of culturally isolated, marked by inept imitation, or it could be not provincial at all, the opposite of provincial. 
So obviously the estates and dead souls are provincial. Culture there exists only as a kind of detritus, the kind of leftovers of some faraway civilization. Those places are the provincial, are the epitome of provinciality um, and they occupy the same uh, symbolic space as the nearby quarter the end. But if you compare this to fathers and son sons or Anna Karenina, while the Kirsanovs and Levin's estates are not lavish establishments, they do exactly what such places are supposed to do. That is, they allow the gentry to partake of the authenticity of rural life, even while providing them with a little space for high cultural freedom, creativity, useful labor, and sheltered from officialdom and state interference, but not necessarily opposed to the state's values. So on some occasions, Russian estates could do what British country houses were thought to do. That is to serve as, one, as what one historian of Britain calls, quote, the image of true civilization and social cultivation in the provinces. In Russia, a huge lavish estate like the Shiremetyevs, complete with its own opera company, managed to reproduce the culture of the capital. But it was precisely the aspiration to do so that left other estates vulnerable to, de to degenerating into inauthenticity and incoherence. That is, if the goal of an ordered, sophisticated, culturally coherent microcosm could not be achieved, the estate space could quickly dissolve into semiotic disarray and second-rate imitation. And another word for that is just provinciality. Okay, so that's peasants and estates and provincial towns. What about regions? What about Russia's regional identities? Given all of European Russia's local subcultures, wouldn't we expect to see the development of literary realism? Well, we might, but we don't. Um, and in fact, if we compare Russian literature's representation of the nation's geography with that of, say, British literature, regionalism's underdevelopment becomes really conspicuous. Russian writers tend to insist on the blankness and homogeneity of provincial places. English writers, by contrast, spent much of the 19th century imagining a very detailed picture of the British Isles, a rich symbolic geography of the nation, everything from London to Jane Austen's estates, the Bronte sisters' moors, Walter Scott's highlands, and on and on. Um, as Edward Said writes, these British texts, quote, developed a picture of England socially, politically, morally charted and differentiated in immensely fine detail in which the nation space was surveyed, evaluated, and made known, unquote. This is precisely what Russian literature was not really doing. It was not much engaged in imagining European Russia's regions in their distinctiveness and particularity. Now, I would emphasize again that the more exotic, less clearly Russian peripheral spaces were different. They were marked off and they were worthy sometimes of different kinds of, um, of representation. I'm thinking that because I'm looking at Yara Sobol and I'm thinking of her work about various, about various peripheries which do indeed generate a very different kind of representation. Um, uh, but to think again about European Russia and to compare um, say Austin's, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park Mansfield Park, we have the very gritty specificity of Portsmouth. We have its shipping economy, naval jargon. In Dead Souls, which is from the same time, we have anonymous bordered N, a place defined by what it lacks and what it's not. So one, one result of this pattern is that in semiotic terms, the difference between something that happens, say, in Rezan and something that happens in Trier is likely to be minimal. And I thought about that because of Franco Moretti's claim that what happens depends a lot on where it happens. Well, yes, but not necessarily within European Russia in the same way. Um, uh, the differences between European Russia's areas, regions, are dwarfed by the difference between capital and province, a distinction so fundamental that the provinces collapse into the not capital. So why is this the case? Well, you could write many books about the historical factors that contributed to this development, and I'll just gesture toward a few of them. For one thing, as we know, there's the intensely centralized nature of the Russian state, and this encouraged or even compelled elites to look toward the center, toward the capital, rather than attempting to base their power or their self-conception on local affiliations. Noblemen who could afford to live permanently in the capitals 
very often chose to do so, opting to stay close to the central bureaucracy that was their main source of power and status. Especially the richest and most sophisticated members of the gentry were often absentee landlords who treated their estates, of which they often possessed more than one, simply as sources of income, not their true homes or their native places, the way, say, um, the English gentry or uh, American planters in the South saw their places, because those places for them, their, their identity and their power depended on close association with specific provincial places. So as one historian writes, Pemishiki, Russian landowners, quote, did not consider themselves representatives of particular localities so much as servitors of the government bureaucracy. So all of this helps to explain why Russian literature in place of regionalism gives us this trope of provincial equivalence. So as Sologub, the first Sologub, the one with two L's in the earlier part of the 19th century, as he puts it in a story from the 1840s, all our provincial towns look the same. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Everything the same, the same, the same. And I took the quote from Sologu, but I could have taken it from virtually any writer in the, in the um, uh, first half of the 19th century or the second half for that matter. And this same strange assertion was reiterated constantly by writers from Gogol through Chekhov and beyond. And it hardly changes over the course of a century and a half. And that's actually weird. How do we explain the constancy of this image? Um, well, if Provincia doesn't change, or the representation of Provincia doesn't change, I think it's because it's imagined as being fundamentally ahistorical. So in Bakhtin's words, the provincial chronotope is eventless. It's mired in what he calls, quote, a viscous and sticky time that, drives it, that drags itself slowly through space. Um, so even though Russian society in reality underwent radical changes in the years that the book treats, um, Provincia continues to be depicted in almost identical terms, as if changes as momentous as the end of serfdom, the rise of a market economy, revolutions in transportation and literacy, the gentry's decline, as if they had no effect on Russia's provincial core. And Gogol, Herz, and Turgenev, Goncharov, Kwasinska, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, Sologub, Sologub with one L, I mean, it goes on and on. They all reprise very similar dead in life provincial places, places distinguished mainly by their indistinguishability from one another. So obviously, I want to say again, this view from the center was not accurate. It's not true. Of course, people outside the capitals tried hard to correct this view. They tried hard to correct the center's various misrepresentations. You have journalists, Krajevjezi, uh, geographers, ethnographers, statesmen, military strategists. They're all working to counter this received idea about provincial homogeneity and monotony. And they're trying to create categories of localness around which real world identities could take shape. And in our own time, this, this work continues. Historians are still trying to correct what Susan Smith Peter calls the state-centered tradition of Russian history, which sees the local as inert, passive, awaiting dynamism from the outside, unquote. In a sense, the 19th century's imaginary version of Provincia can be read as the prehistory of the modernists, Buit, that untranslatable Russian noun Devoting, denoting what is pointedly untranscendent about daily life, daily life that's forever mired in the trivial and the material. I think that the province's trope prepares the ground for the modernist strenuous rejection of all things daily and banal. Indeed, before Boit assumed its sharply negative connotations in the modernist and early Soviet period, along with words like Mishanstha and Koshlist, I think the idea of provinciality, provincialness, did much of the same cultural work. Materiality, repetition, routine, food, stasis, the anti-aesthetic and the anti-poetic, the provinces tend to function much as the daily grind of Buit will function for Mayakovsky and others. So when we read that for Mayakovsky, Buit signified, quote, the general enslavement of man to physical, biological, and social necessity, we could well be reading about Provincia in Herzen or in Gogol or Chekhov or any other, any number of other 19th century writers. Okay, so I'm going to 
move toward a conclusion now. Um, one thing that becomes clear when we analyze the Russian discourse on provincia is that provinciality represents a more serious threat to a positive view of Russianness than it does to say Frenchness or Englishness or Americanness, because of course there are versions of provincialism that are represented in various traditions. But say in French literature, disdain for things provincial, that is the world outside of Paris, it doesn't imply the same kind of anxiety. Once you make it to Paris, you might fail or you might be disillusioned as in Balzac's Lost Illusions, but you always stand a chance of freeing yourself from provincial taint. Even more important, Paris itself will forever remain as the true, the undeniably central metropolis. Paris is the capital of the 19th century, as Walter Benjamin said, a very real standard to which one may perhaps attain. It's not portable, it's not elusive or illusory. Consequently, consequently, it seems that France, despite its extremely strong tradition of centralization and top-down culture, finds the provincial to be distasteful, perhaps worthy of, worthy of contempt, but not threatening. In Russia, provincialism, provincialism is worrisome. And this, I think, is because the provinciality of the provinces, which is such a, pre such a preoccupation in the 19th century, it can be seen to reflect the provinciality, maybe even the inauthenticity um, of the entire nation. So the Russian capitals always trying to catch up to and imitate the West. Maybe they're no less provincial than the provinces in comparison to the real center, if you think that there's a real center and that center is in Europe. So given this anxiety, the worry that the relationship between capital and province might re recapitulate, the relationship between Western Europe and Russia, I would argue that Previncia assumed its role in Russia's cultural imaginary, not because of its own intrinsic qualities, but because of Russia's conception of itself as a whole. The provinces writing about Previncia becomes a way of interrogating Russian identity itself. But I don't want to end on this note because it sounds negative. I want to add with, I want to end instead with a most important qualification and with, which, I, which I hope is what people will take away from the book. And that is that in the Russian tradition, a sense of one's own provinciality, while painful, is extraordinarily generative and it leads to sophisticated insights. In other words, in Russia, provinciality doesn't mean the same thing it does to someone in the West, like say T.S. Eliot. So for T.S. Eliot, being provincial signifies nothing but degeneration and insufficiency. He has a famous essay called What is a Classic, which is from 1944, and it really probably should have been called um, uh, What is a Provincial and How Can We Not Be One? Um, so Eliot writes that provinciality is, quote, the decay of a common belief and a common culture. He sees it as nothing but degradation. And this is simply not the case in Russia because Russia's sense, its anxious sense of its own provinciality cannot be separated from the enormously productive cultural syncretism that makes possible its literary tradition. In other words, provincialism in Russia, although a form of marginalism or, or peripheralism is central to the nation's identity. Life is Elsewhere argues that thanks to the peculiarities of Russia's historical situation, it's kind of inside-outside relationship to Western high culture, its literature developed a more nuanced understanding of central periphery relations than those who occupy undisputed centers. In fact, we might even agree with Mikhail Epstein's kind of funny and controversial claim that, quote, Russia is utterly and deeply provincial in its very essence. We might agree with him as long as we keep our eyes trained on what is, in the end, the aesthetically miraculous nature of this provincialism. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your listening. How long did I go? Oh, I went pretty long. Thank you so much, Anne. That was extremely interesting. Um, so we're gonna move on to the Q and A. Um, I have enabled chat with everyone. So if you could please uh, make sure that you are sending your chat into uh, sending your messages into the general chat rather than just to me. Um, and Ilya, if you want to take away the Q&A moderation. Yes. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. 
thank you so much uh, for uh, and for for um, and Sasha for for uh, allowing me to be part of this and to moderate the discussion. It is uh, of course uh, extremely gratifying for me to uh, be able to see this project completed. I came to NYU uh, approximately at the time when the project was beginning, and you know saw it in various sections and, and bits and pieces and. And, and, and saw and suffer over it. And, and, uh, and to now see this beautiful object uh, with beautiful insides as well, uh, it, it's, it's uh, extremely, extremely uh, pleasing. Um, before I, I ask just a couple of quick questions, uh, hopefully, and, and then move on to, because there are so many people, move on to the discussion, I just wanted to say how impressed I am in, in this final reading, in some cases rereading of the chapter in, final, in this final reading of the book um, uh, by, by sort of the remarkably intelligent, wide-ranging uh, uh, scholarship of this book uh, with its sort of extremely thoughtful and thought-provoking observations just everywhere on every page. And uh, of course, it is simply like everything Anne writes, a joy to read. So. <laughs> So, so I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but please read the book. Um, it, is, it is one of those uh, books that uh, fulfills the promise of the 18th century to give instruction and pleasure at the same time. Uh, so um, with this, I, uh, I, I wanted to uh, just make some observations about um, what, I, what I find uh, particularly intriguing about, about the, main, the book's main argument. Uh, and this is um, that, you know, we begin with this kind of rigid, fairly rigid opposition uh, between, between the provinces and, and the capital. And, uh, and we're fairly quickly, I think, convinced that it's there, that it's sort of rooted in the way people spoke, the way people thought, the way people imagined space, the way people imagined other things as well. And then we, we, we end up with this entity, which I think is a kind of, you know, interesting surplus entity uh, from within this opposition that really is a kind of driver of the, of the narrative of the book for me, which is provinciality, of course, right, which is, which is sort of separates itself from the provinces uh, as, as a kind of, you know, um, abstracted synecdoche of, of, of the province, right, as a kind of more general phenomenon, generalizable phenomenon and more mobile phen phenomenon. And so what we get is uh, then uh, several outcomes of this. Uh, as I see it. One is that it now becomes possible not just to speak about the opposition between possible and even necessary, not just to speak about the opposition between um, center and periphery, capital and, and, and the province, but also about all of these subtler uh, elements of the distinctions within the Russian symbolic geography, which and you mentioned in your presentations as, as well, right? The estate some really interesting thoughts on the estate. We get we get uh, we get observations on the um, um, sort of on, on on the liminal spaces, the marginal spaces, right? Siberia, the Caucasus. Um, we get we we sort of come to realize that the local and the and the and the regional is not provincial, even if it's in the provinces, oh. right? Even if it's located in the provinces, it's just not. A provincial way it's not a, a way of looking at these spaces uh from f with the uh, with the uh, uh with with the uh, optic of, of the provinces so that's one effect of this kind of emergence of provinciality out of the, the provinces um the other effect that seems to occur is that it is then possible to position this term or we begin to realize quickly how this term is embedded in a whole series of categories and positions that are that that pertain much more broadly to uh, you know crudely speaking modernity's modes of self conceptualization and self legitimation right and so we get provinciality becomes entangled with the opposition between the universal and the particular the enlightened present and the dark past form and formlessness high and low taste and all of these sort of other and then, which is in some ways, you know, the, the extra, the sort of real bonus uh, uh, of, 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 what, of what takes place of this dynamic is that then all of these oppositions are also volatilized, right? 
Mm -hmm. So provinciality makes it very difficult to keep the, all these oppositions straight, uh, to, keep, to keep them separate. So that the positive term in each of these oppositions um, starts threatening uh, or finds it difficult to keep the negative term, the lower term, <laughs> right? So like, uh, you know, a practitioner of deconstruction would have a kind of field day here, uh, um, uh, but, 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 but so do you, right, uh, in, 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 in the book. So what we get, we get a sense in which the provincial, and this of course echoes some of the things you said in the presentation, the provincial mocks, uh, parodies, uh, not intentionally, right, but simply structurally happening, but by happening to be there, mocks, provokes, uh, mimics, um, the, 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 the provincial person min mimics the fashionable dandy, reminding the dandy that, um, you know, the dandy is, 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 you know, both, first of all, trying not to be a provincial, and that itself is a danger, right? And second of all, and second of all, of course, uh, is always in danger of falling into, uh, into provinciality. Uh, it, you know, it, it sort of, you, you get, you get, um, of course, the very curious uh, issue of homogeneity, which is identified first to begin with, with the provinces, and then we come to realize that this is something that is, that can easily, just as easily be predicated of the capital, right? Mm -hmm. the, the idea of this kind of extremely ordered organization, rationalized organization of the capital. And, uh, and you know, there are, there are a number of examples of this. Of course, authenticity and inauthenticity, right? The, the, the imitative nature of the, of the provincial makes one think, and makes us, makes us I think, think uh, of, 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 um, of, of the, the, you know, imitative nature of the high society lady, right? So, so you know, who is more imitative than, than a member of the royal court? Right, uh, and and so you get you get to a point at which you know you have to be Tatiana or an Anna Karenina in order to be able to maintain some semblance of sincerity and natural yeah. Yeah. natural authenticity uh, in order to stay in that um, in that um, um, space and not become uh, absorbed into the deep deeply imitative tendencies of the of the center, right? So. Um, you know, and then of course my favorite example that I will, I will mention, uh, and Anne talks about the novel of the ordinary story. My favorite example is when uh, the older Aduif, the uncle Aduif, is telling the, his nephew that you know he is a provincial and an Asiatic because he thinks that women should be forced to love, you know, to f fulfill their promises. Right? We, we, he, the uncle says we don't do that. Right? We, and then he gives him a long talk about how we discipline women, we survey them, we, we sort of have much more these, these, these extremely sophisticated mechanisms for controlling the woman, right? Uh, and you don't, you know, and this is supposed to be humane uh, on some level, right? The reader realizes- In modern, yeah. Modern, right, yeah. right. And, uh, and then of course, you know, the, the woman at the end of the novel starts fading away, um, um, potentially dying, and then Adwif himself recognizes that this is just as tyrannical. Uh, a, a way of, of behaving as, as the, the sort of Asiatic uh, mode as well. So again, this kind of mirroring. So, so one question for me is, I wonder um, how seriously you ultimately take this. This is everywhere, right, uh, it, throughout the book. But I wonder if you think of these moments of volatilization as sort of exceptions, as, as kind of at the margins of this, uh, of this tradition, uh, literary tradition, or is it really uh, kind of at the crux or at the center uh, of, of what's, what's really at stake in setting up the opposition yeah. in center, center and periphery? That is um, one. And then what is, sorry, sorry and then what, if, if, it's, if it's more central, what, according to what logic does the volatilization happen? In other words, often, as I read the book, often I felt like individuals, the individual historical actors, they really want to, to sort of preserve them often. Mm -hmm. And the text doesn't allow, right? Somehow the text makes it, makes it very difficult to allow, very difficult to do that. And I, you know, I just wonder, like, is this a cultural logic, a broader cultural logic, some of which towards, towards some of which you mentioned, is this an uh, aesthetic, generic, right? Are we talking about the kind of um, genre issues that make it difficult, more difficult to, to, do, uh, to do this? 
of course, the great, this great, the great example, which my favorite chapter, I have to confess, in the book is the Gogol chapter. Uh, and uh, it's just uh, really uh, uh, fantastic and, and fun and, and, and very, very true, <laughs> more importantly. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you say Google, uh, go, for Gogol, the distinction collapses eventually, right? And, and you say, Gogol, I quote from the book, uh, comes close to imagining a world without any cultural or geographic locus of authenticity, right? So it's just absent, right? It's or and so and so the question is, but but he does place it somewhere, right? He places it uh, with uh, some vision outside, right? It's not in the West, yeah. But it's some it's this some vision of of a kind of you know orthodox proper citizenship yeah. in the autocratic state, national, broadly Russian state, right? And we get, and we get this kind of uh, question of the center, which, which is some, something you talked about at the end of your presentation, the center being reimagined as elsewhere, but not just, yeah. The, yeah. but sort of, but as a kind of utopian space, right? So if you could comment, or if you have comments on this, that would be great too. And then a, a third, very, very quick question that I had, which is related to this whole Google point, which is, uh, I was reminded as I read uh, some of the theoretical sections of the book, I was reminded of Benedict Anderson, whom you mentioned here, specifically of his comment on the dynastic, the, di the organization of space in dynastic realm, right, rather than in, 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 in the nation state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? And, and, you know, and again, this is, this is quite closely related to what you said towards the end, you know, you have this moment in Revisor, which you discussed, where the, the, the all meaning flows from the center, right? This is a kind of standard, according to Anderson, at least, the kind of standard conception of, of, of how things work uh, within a dynastic realm, whereas, of course, the homogeneous distribution of national space, right, is what is necess necessary in order for a kind of national um, imaginary to emerge, as far as he is concerned. And so, what we get instead, you know, what, what is the, you, you homogenize space and you have to derive meaning from, some, from somewhere else, right? You kind of come, you know, you, you imagine the society, a social body, a social organism, right? That lives, that relates to each other through interconnections and, you know, various kinds of people act in their own separate ways. And then that adds up or fails to add up to some kind of surplus val welfare or well-being for everybody or for particular individuals, right? So, um, of course, there are many arguments about the relationship between specifically the novel and the nation state. Is this, is this a, a case then uh, in which a Russian novel is yet again, you know, to use Roberto Schwartz's um, uh, expression, a, a misplaced idea, right? It, it, hap it finds itself in this other space and then it has to reckon with these other imaginaries and specifically the imaginary of the, of the of the something like a dynastic realm or an empire, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so the novel becomes this kind of torn apart by these two contradictory tendencies to think yeah. of space as a national space and to think of space as imperial. So these are just quick three quick questions, and now I'm going to well, let you. Uh, while you look at the the chat, um, yeah. which I'm not even going to try to navigate, I'll try to respond to some of these comments, which are really so so brilliant actually and um, some of them too brilliant for me to answer right now but um, but very useful the first thing I would say is just in response to your remarks on modernity that it was actually in conversation with you and with my colleague Yanni Kotsonis that I started to understand um, the degree to which being provincial is a function of trying to be modern and that there was no such thing as provinciality before there is a kind of belief in modernity. So that I think um, was, was a really important um, insight that I got through speaking to colleagues um, about the project. Um, and that also points toward another, another point I wanted to make, which is that I didn't discuss it very much in this talk, but really um, I hope that in the book, what comes out is being provincial is definitely as much about time as it is about space, right? You're worried that you're not in the right time and that you're not going to be able to get to the right time. And I think that definitely speaks to, to some of your other comments. Um, the question about whether or not this sort of volatilization 
of the two poles, the positive and the negative, you know, the, the Stalitsa and Provincia, um, whether or not that those moments are exceptional, they're really not exceptional. As you point out, it's happening all the time. As soon as you set up that binary, it starts spinning, right? And um, you, you have, uh, you know, characters in Dostoevsky, for example, commenting on that flipping all the time. Um, saying things like, well, just because we're provincials doesn't mean we um, don't know what's going on in the world, right? And implying that they know more than the people who are in the center. So yes, I think it's as soon as the binary gets set up, it's immediately unstable. Yeah. And as far as your question about whether this is kind of another iteration of the um, the problem, the problem that Russia has, um, if you try to, if you try to understand the Russian novel in relationship to the nation state, because the Russian nation state doesn't look like the, the kind of typical one that we're supposed to believe in, um, that we're supposed to believe is typical, it probably does. Um, and I hope that your book will talk about that because it's too, it's, it's, I never really thought about it before, but yes, I think that that this kind of preoccupation with the provinces and provinciality is a response to precisely the problem that, you know, they're working in genres that uh, were not kind of, did not have an organic relationship to, to their, to the society. Right. Um, I think, I think. Um, but further than that, I wouldn't go at this point because I haven't thought about it, but I definitely think that would be a productive um, direction to go in. So thank you very much. Um, Great. So I, I will try to, I've never done this before, so please forgive me if it happens, if I do it awkwardly, but I, I'm just going to go through some of the questions of which there are many uh, already uh, on the chat. So the first question comes from Sarah Brooks, and, uh, and it's about the, the Jefferson Jefferson's grand plan. So despite Jefferson's grand plan, different places in the United States have vastly different fields. I live in DC, our city is, uh, our city plan is not a grid, but rather spokes a wheel. Uh, we have a beltway that circles around the area, but is large enough that uh, it never runs through DC proper, but rather through the neighboring states of Virginia and Maryland. Uh, we have the expression inside the beltway as a way of dividing uh, what in what NYC are often called bridges. bridges. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that basically Jefferson is operating in the realm of the imaginary, right? Um, and in fact, all these local identities are constantly pushing back in the American tradition against the grid. Um, even if you think the grid is a good thing, and Jefferson thought the grid was a good thing, it was about equality, right? Um, they're still pushing back for better or worse. And one sign of that is that pretty much every single canonical author in the Americas, in, in America, in the 19th century, in the United States, was a regionalist, right? Mm -hmm. Emerson, Poe, mm -hmm. Hawthorne, right? They were all regionalists. And they were the kings of art, right? The biggest guys. So yeah, the grid is just imaginary. And reality is pushing up, kind of bubbling up under that grid all the time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, OK, another question we, I have from uh, Alona Vanova. Um, um, uh, thank you so very much for a brilliant thought-provoking lecture. Do you think that a Russian circle geography as well as American land ordinance is connected with our perceptions of, the, of time? If yes, oh. could you please elaborate on that? Oh, that is a, that's a really, really good question. Um, and I would suspect that the answer has to be yes. Um, uh, I, although I'm going to struggle in articulating, you know, how exactly. I mean, my, my guess is that, you know, if you're in the symbolic geography with the middle and you're moving out with the concentric circles, time is, um, not only does it slow down and become what Bakhtin calls this sort of sticky time that's mired in slowness, um, it also probably is more cyclical. I mean, the grid is associated with modernity, you know, how much money do you make in an hour? How many, how many miles can you travel, you know, in a day? Um, I think that, that the grid is ultimately about an economy. 
um, and that economy is certainly tied to a certain way of thinking about time. So if you think about Stoltz, for example, in Avlomov, Stoltz is always thinking about, um, he thinks in terms of railroads and um, measurable space and how much he's going to have to pay to cover a certain amount of space. Um, he's, he's already living on the grid, right? Whereas Oblomov himself is living in one of these outer circles where everything is sort of like repetitious, cyclical, slow. So I, that's kind of an impressionistic answer, but that's my, that's my reaction to the time question. Great. Okay, next question from Hila Cohen. Um, uh, thanks, Anne. Through the lens you have developed uh, to look at the contrast between the capitals and the provinces in the 19th century, how do you see the contrast between the capitals and the regions today? Um, uh, well, first of all, I think that I'm not, I'm, I'm not a scholar of 20th century literature or 21st century literature, and I'm certainly not a political scientist, but as all of us know, you know, in political terms, the Russian center is always trying to raid terrain in the regions, right? Like appoint the governors, reappoint the governors, um, uh, suck in the resources, um, do what it's basically always done. Um, and so my, my guess is that in political and economic terms, the regions are still um, fighting back a little bit, but I would imagine that they're governed by elites who benefit from the relationship. And so they're still just sort of what uh, a journalist called 1870, in the 1870s, he called, said that Moscow is um, a giant spider that sucks Russia dry. Um, culturally, um, you you would probably, Hila, you would know more about this than I do. Um, I think that they're again, you know, there's plenty of pushback against this homogenizing vision. Um, whether or not it could be described as regionalism, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I think in some places, my sense is in a place like Yekaterinburg, maybe so. Um, uh, but I feel like I'm not really qualified to talk about that so much. Uh, next question from um, Shama Shahadat. Um, and thank you for this very intriguing topic uh, and your interesting, inspiring talk. I was thinking about Lokman's idea that semiotic activity is happening at the periphery, at the border, while the yeah. center is static. Could this idea be applied to the provinces, or is this a Soviet perspective that Lokman applies static Moscow semiotic reactive Tartu, which is not true for the 19th century? I, that's a great question, and I think it is true for the 19th century, even though, um, even though there's the texts themselves seem kind of to deny often the cultural dynamism, the interestingness, the weirdness of what's going on in the provinces. But in fact, there is all of this interesting weirdness that's bubbling up all the time. I mean, look at somebody like Gogo, right? He's not exactly a provincial because he's Ukrainian, right? So it's a little bit, you know, he, he um, in a way, I think he's better positioned to draw on the weirdness of Provincia because he himself is even a little bit outside of that. Um, but no, I think that Lotman's, Lotman's insight is absolutely appropriate for, for the 19th century. Um, and then of course you see it in somebody like Platonov, for example. Um, it's, it's very evident in the early Soviet period. I'm going to have to learn a lot more about 20th and 21st century literature because people are going to keep asking me these questions. Well, where's the sequel? Right, right. <laughs> so uh, a comment from Sybil and Forster. Uh, it's telling that every time I get these catalogs advertising books from Moscow, books from Petersburg, and then books from the provinces. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, it... I think that there's still a sense in which, you know, quote, books from the provinces are, are treated as raw material. Not always, but often, right? Um, and this is something that the 19th century regional um, intellectuals, journalists complained about bitterly, right? We are not your raw material. We have, we have a voice, we have a point of view. Um, we don't need to just kind of like send stuff to you, intellectual stuff, for you to process. Um, and I think it's still, it, it, that can be recapitulated sometimes now, 
Although it seems to me that with the, with the growing strength of regional universities that that will be countered, I imagine. Okay, okay. I have a question from Russell Valentino. Um, the Moscow postal map uh, and the claims of its centrality to Rus make me wonder about the absence of the rest of Rus. In fact, the older, more central parts of it in this vision. Yeah. If you look at the map of the current central federal district of Russia, the truncation of Rus becomes very clear. But uh, by contrast, the Moscow postal map, uh, most post, most postal ring is nicely round. My question yeah. is whether you've thought about this shifting center in your work and the selective conception of Rus. Questions, question two is uh, about the tension between things and places that are often thought of as quintessentially Russian and defining of Russia, but are not central by definition. Uh, I have in mind the forests uh, as treated by Melnikov Pichersky, Vlisach, yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and examined by Jane Koslow in Hartman, Russia. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for both of those questions. I can tell you're a, you're a, a person who works in the 19th century. And um, um, in answer to the first one, I think that, that um, in, in the imperial period, there was sort of a deliberate, or, or I'm imagining it was somewhat deliberate um, suppression of the memory of these earlier Rus centers, right? So even a town like Vladimir, the central state, the Russian state that was centered in Moscow and Petersburg did not want to be thinking about what these cities used to be, right? That they used to be these, these centers of their own. Right? So I think that, that that's very real. The phenomenon you're describing is very real. And actually, in the expanded version of the map that I didn't give you, you can see still some of those, um, some of those other circles. Um, but I think that in, in the 19th century, this kind of historical memory is not very evident in the text. So, you, know, get, you get to Vladimir, and maybe some people you know, think of it as what it used to be as the center of its own world but most people think of it as provincia, and that's the way it gets represented. So I, I hope that starts to answer the question. And then the question about Mielnikov Pichersky, which is really interesting to me. I have a chapter on Mielnikov, and maybe you'll be the only person who reads it, um, but um, I think he's, he's absolutely fascinating um, because, as you say, this, this, these forests, this region that he's representing, it is at once, um, uh, you know, quintessentially Russian, you know, what does he call it, Kandovaya Rus, like the heartland of Russia. And it's also kind of imaginary, right? It's also kind of Kitesh. It's also kind of a place that's so closed off from the rest of the world that it doesn't completely exist, um, maybe. And certainly by the time that Milan you know, is writing about it in Vesach, it's, it's already the old believer culture that he's describing has been destroyed. He's helped to destroy it. So you, he's imagining something as central to Russian identity um, and that thing has already been exterminated and he participated in the extermination of that thing, which um, is actually pretty typical of regionalism in, in lots of traditions. You usually make something into kind of a magic region after modernity or war or plague or whatever has already destroyed that place or that thing. Um, so I think Mielnikov is incredibly, incredibly interesting. Um, the other thing I love about Mielnikov is this kind of insane degree of particularity, right? How many words for wooden spoon? How many words for swamp? Um, this, this kind of cataloging impulse um, that, uh, for one thing, I think goes along with regionalism, but also in representations of Provincia, there's this same kind of fixation on the thickness of, of material life. Um, so I just, it's, it's a really fascinating text to me. From uh, Evgeny Manjurin, uh, when do regional voices become independent enough of the power of this trope to produce convincing alternative imaginations of their locality? Not until the thaw? Um, again, I wish I could defer to Soviet special. Here, I mean, first of all, in Siberia, much earlier, right? Because Siberia is not the provinces. Um, it's so much a region that it's almost its own country, in a sense, at certain points. So I would say in Siberia, much earlier. Um, 
you know, I can't really speak to the Soviet tradition. I can't really say, you know, at what point these, re quote, regional voices became convincing. I hope that other people will write about that because it's incredibly important. I know that in the 50s, you still get, um, you still get people saying things like, you know, oh, my provincial identity is a, is a brand, a pleima on me, and I can never get rid of it. Right? Even if you have the right accent, even if you went to Mbu'u, even if they're still talking about provincialness, provincial origins as this, this kind of, um, you know, black or, you know, mark. Um, but maybe other people can speak to when regional voices start to be, start to be convincing and important. A question from Maya Binak. Okay, sorry, just one thing to, to think about it in terms of the 19th century. So there's this wonderful, in the 1870s, there's this wonderful polemic argument between two journalists, um, one in Nizhny Novgorod and one in Petersburg. One is Mardovtsev and one is Gatsitsky. I think Catherine Yevtukhov writes about this as well. And basically one of them, the Nizhny Novgorod is saying, we exist. In fact, the name of the article is, the provinces exist. <laughs> Um, and he's saying, you know, we have our own culture, we have our own journals, we, we have our own traditions, you know, we have our own folk ways. And the guy in Petersburg is saying, it's like, ah, eh, you're just raw material, whatever. The principle of centralization, it's going to suck you all in. So, you know, you're just, you just exist to feed us. Um, and the, the polemic is absolutely fascinating, um, re reading the back and forth. Uh, so a question from Maya Vinakur. And I've been mulling over what you've said about how in the 19th century, provincial is not the same as, or is distinguished from the peasant in the sense that provinciality regards the presence of a capital, uh, however distant, as a grounding definitional force. Uh, what happens to provinciality then in the Soviet period once again, which brings a glorification, at least rhetorically, of a peasant, uh, and a, uh, or at least anti-aristocratic values, while yeah. doing to reduce the power of the center of the Well, there's this great, there's of course the great moment in the 1920s when you get, you know, you have a horizontal moment, maybe not a whole decade, but it, like uh, in um, Papierny writes in Futur 2 that, um, uh, you know, there's this period of time when, when things are supposed to get horizontal and you're supposed to be able to, not in the sense of an American grid, but in the sense of kind of all places matter, right? And, um, you know, peasants are going to matter and people of different ethnicities are going to matter and people out there, you know, on the steppes or in the north, they're going to matter. And that's very strongly reflected in representation. Like if you think of a film like, um, what's it called, Shastaya Chesmira, where you kind of go all over the place and look at all of these Soviet places. Um, so there's this, this moment when um, I don't think, I mean, peasants could be included in that, right? They're folkways. Um, uh, and then, and then Aspect Pierny writes, uh, he argues that then in the 30s, the vertical reasserts itself and, um, you know, again, you have this like center periphery model. As far as, as peasant in the, in the, again, I can really only think about the early Soviet period. Um, I think you, uh, peasants are still better than, say, um, you know, like, like petit bourgeois, trashy, abuivatili, you know, the people who live in these little towns and are aspiring to be petit bourgeois, right? They're, they're worse than peasants, I think, to the Soviets. The peasants can be converted. They can be turned into workers, right? I mean, Soviet people need to help me here, but Maya, does that, does that uh, help? Yes, and I'm, I'm sorry I asked. Oh, hi question in a series of like, well, what about the Soviet period? No, 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 it's fine. I mean, it's, it is really, you know, it's really intriguing. And I do feel like the provincia trope in general is kind of like a prehistory of a lot of Soviet tropes, you know, Boyd Porschlist, um, I, I feel like provincia sort of prepares the way for, for a lot of these things that are familiar to us by, um, you know, by the 1820s, by the 1920s, say. Um, from Sybil and Forster, uh, we certainly tell our students that in the Soviet period, the provincial city, university, uh, 
should be should be uh, for could be a, a, a safer place for a, an innovative scholar, Martin Lotman. Yes, than yes. Uh, though perhaps with a hint of outrage that the system kept them uh, a distance away, uh, at a yeah. distance that way. That's a, that's a really, really good point. And I, I don't focus on that in the book, but I do think that there is that, um, uh, you know, there are moments when, when you can escape surveillance and control, certainly by being in, in more, quote, obscure places. And um, I, I don't know about right now, but maybe it's possible that in a place that's not provincial, but that's also not Moscow or Petersburg, say like Kazan, where Jane Burbank has done a lot of work, maybe there's more, maybe there's a sense of more, a different kind of intellectual freedom there. I'm really not sure. Yeah, and, and Maya's follow up, sure, also a viable alternative in case you were banned from a more central yes. institution for being Jewish or otherwise non brown Yes. Uh, question from Jillian Porter. Um, Thanks for a great talk. Does the presence of two capital, St. Petersburg, Moscow, support or trouble the distinction between capital and provinces and that between center and periphery? Yeah, weirdly, not really. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't break down the binary, actually. Um, you know, Petersburg and Moscow, like in Chekhov's story, um, you know, that's, that they're just, they're one place, they're the center, no matter where they are. And everything else is the not center, right? What what is Chekhov's bureaucrat says? Moscow, uh, Petersburg, at the Nasha Rodina or something like that. As this province, colonia. This is the provinces, the colonies. Which is another thing that's really weird. It's like to what extent are these quote provinces? Um, uh, you know, what is their relationship to what we would call colonies in other situations? And because it's a contiguous empire that's a much more complicated question that it, than it would be in other places, obviously. Uh, from Anne O'Donnell. Um, uh, and related to that, to what extent was the center connected not just to power, but to the state? And in what ways, if at all, could it migrate into provincial capitals where the state was represented? I love all this. Yeah, this is a very, yeah, this is a great question. And certainly state power tried very hard to, to represent itself um, in provincial towns, right? So like all of these laws about, about facades, for example, for example, in Paradnast, like how the, the towns had to look a certain way, the governor's house had to have a certain number of windows. Um, it was very disturbing if, if an official arrived from the capital and showed up in the town and the town didn't look like a town. It didn't look like a European town the way it was supposed to. So yes, the state was trying to make its present felt, presence felt um, in, in exactly these ways. Um, and this is why, even though it's not true to say like Salagub it says all Russian towns look the same, well, they kind of do. <laughs> and they kind of do because that was the law, right? Starting under Catherine, there were laws about how the buildings had to look, how, how they faced the streets, you know, how wide the sidewalks were. So, um, um, you know, I don't know, Anne, if that gets, gets at your question, but certainly the state is trying to be there in these places. Um, question from Erin Hutchinson. Uh, Anne, I was also very struck by your statement that the uh, provincial not the same as a peasant, and wonder what you make of the fact that in the Soviet period, it was namely the writers who identified with the peasantry, the so-called Devenshiki, who yes. saw regionalism in literature. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is, I mean, I think basically what you have there is Tolstoy's imaginary peasant, right? Dostoevsky's imaginary peasant. Um, it's a version, it's a version of the peasant that people in the capitals are able to imagine. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, Matriona didn't really exist. She existed and, and you know, there were, there were like real peasant people in, in, including collective farms in different places. But also I think that this tradition is probably drawing on, um, uh, you know, Tolstoy's and Dostoevsky's and others idealized version of the peasantry. And um. life. And, and, if, and it makes sense that this would be a tradition that could be used to push back 
um, because one of the things about provinciality is it sort of cordons off the peasantry and keeps them pure, right? Provincials are messy, fake, embarrassing. Um, you know, you don't want to be that. They have like ugly furniture and bad taste. Peasants are pure. Right. So it makes sense. There's this sort of like reserve of peasant purity that you could draw on if you're Solzhenitsyn or somebody like that to push back. From uh, Sasha Smith. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm sorry. I just had to, I just happened to notice. I'm not reading the chat, but I saw Maya Vinokur says, Gorky thought peasants were not even human. Well, there's that, that incredibly wonderful um, text from the early 20s that um, uh, on the Russian peasantry that Gorky published, I think in Berlin, he wasn't allowed to publish. I don't think it was published in the Soviet Union until after the Soviet Union didn't even exist anymore. And this, so Gorky, unlike Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, has no illusions about the peasant, right? Because he basically grew up with peasants and he thinks peasants are beasts. And he will have nothing to do with this idealization. Uh, from Sasha Smith, thank you very much, Anne. <clears throat> and from Hilo Cohen, thank you, Anne. That, that gives us so much to think about. Uh, from a uh, question now uh, from um, Emily Wong. Uh, Anne, uh, thanks for a lovely talk. This was a uh, great way to have a Wednesday. Uh, I know he's borderline 20th century, but I hope you write about Mikhail Kuzmin in your next project. You provide such an interesting case study in aspirational provinciality and real provinciality, and also obsession with bourgeois taste. And he deserves more attention, in my opinion. Oh, thank you for that tip. That's a really, really good idea. No, I have not written about Kuzmin, but that, that's, you know, I could have actually in this project, but I didn't. My, my the, the late 19th, early 20th century kind of figure that I chose was, was Salagub, the one L Salagub, and um, um, his vision, his, vision of the nightmare provinces, but um, thank you for the Kuzmin suggestion. That's a great idea for the future. Um, and um, right, so Emily Wong's uh, follow up, pretending to be a peasant and also hiding his age to be a fancier dandy in St. Petersburg. Yeah, uh, exactly, that's wonderful. And, and Maya has a, a, a an association with um, um, with with uh, Husmans. Uh, with what? With Husmans. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm skipping a little bit of what this what I take to be an exchange. This will this will be preserved, right? The the chat. Will yeah, be and don't worry about it. I mean, it's not. You're not going to be able to. I I'm in awe of your ability to look at this chat and field questions. I could never do that. Marina uh, Alexandrovna, uh, thank you so much for a uh, fantastic talk. Very much looking forward to reading your book. Curious to see if you talk about Grybayedov's Chatsky declaring his intention to escape to the village, the wilderness, to the aunt, to Saratov, um, which is uh, seen kind of as a refuge from harassment and abuse of big cities. Yes. That's a great question. And, you know, I should have done um, Gribayedov in the Pushkin chapter <laughs> because there's a Pushkin, there's a Pushkin chapter because there has to be a Pushkin chapter because, you know, Nasha so, but Pushkin doesn't really fit, you know, Pushkin. And I think Gribayedov doesn't either, doesn't exactly fit either. And so um, I wish I had thought of that because I could have spoken about him as the sort of you know, what do, the, what do the provinces mean? What does the village mean? What does it mean to go to Saratov before this trope has kind of deformed, distorted everybody's vision of these places? You know, it would have meant, it meant something really different. Certainly means, you know, something very different in Onyegin. Um, So thank you for that. That, that would have fit, I think, with the, in the Pushkin chapter. Um, there's a question from Tatiana Linkoeva. Um, I'm interested in borderline, where and borderline quotation marks, where and how culturally, geographically did provincialism end? Ah, uh, so, sort of like where the limits, the limits would be. Yeah. Mm. That's a really good question. And um, it's, it's actually very interesting to watch um, 
to watch it change. So, for example, um, in in Pushkin's Kapitalska Dochka, for example, you have the steps, and the steps in that text, which is from what 1837, 36, um, they they're not the provinces yet, right? They're a weird kind of semi-wild hybrid place full of, you know, tribes, full of people who are not Russian and full of Cossacks who are even scarier than the, than the ethnic types, right? So it's not the provinces. Now, you know, by the time you get, you know, a couple of decades later, the steppes are provincial. In Chekhov, the steps are totally provincial, and you have provincial towns on the steps. So I think it's a moving target, and the best place to look is in representations of the step. Like, when do they stop being wild and exotic, and when do they just become boring? Um, and, and uh, you know, you can see that happening already in Kapitanska Gochka. Okay. And I have a last question. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to, to, to your question, but we are already over time. Uh, and this is several questions from uh, Ed Lazzarini. Um, uh, to what extent did distance from the centers of Russia engen engender difference in the views of provinces or portions thereof? Not merely as a result of countable distance, but also of other internal provincial features that were emphatically and in increasingly non-Russian as distance grew. Ah. Does the latter reality subvert the view among Russians that the provinces were all the same. Lastly, in my studies of a variety of provinces, it appears that among the local bureaucracy and landowners, many were surprisingly indifferent to what the centers desired. Yeah. And were, quite, yeah. uh, were often quite critical as well. Has yes. any of this struck you in your approach to uh, production of your book? Thank you very much for this question. It gives me another chance to reiterate that, you know, I'm really writing about this counterfactual trope, really an image that is promulgated by the center. And it's absolutely true that if you go to provincial centers, provincial places, you get other forms of representation altogether. And it doesn't even have to be very far from the center. You know, it can be it can be in Vladimir. It can be. Um, it doesn't have to be way far out in an exotic place. So um, and and precisely um, what what you say is is obviously true. That a lot of times local officials, local elites, they just want to get the center off their backs, right? And they'll say what they're supposed to say, and they'll say that they built the governor's palace to look the way it's supposed to look, but representation um, is not reality. And I'm really only talking about representation. So because I, I'm focusing on representation and sort of this gaze from the center, I can't answer the specifics of your question, like what happens in different places. Um, the closest I got to it was when I did this sort of case study of the journalists, the journalist in Nizhny Novgorod, who is so angry about the kind of appropriation of provincial cultures by the center. And what he does is argue, you know, forever. I mean, he, he goes on and on and on with all of these particularities about his region. My region is like this, it does this, it does that, it does that. It's different from this adjacent region. It's different from that other region. How dare you say that we're all the same, right? And it's actually kind of sad because you feel him fighting this like losing battle. <laughs> Um, because just because of resources, you know, because of money and printing presses and and distribution networks, really. Um, but I would imagine that this is happening in, in various places as well. I hope that that answers your question. Um, okay, well, we'll have to stop here. Sorry. Yeah, let, let me just say thank you so much. I really, really appreciate everyone listening and I appreciate the questions. Um, it's it's really been a pleasure, and thank you to Ilya, and to Sasha, and to the Jordan Center. It was great.